Welcome, everybody. I'm Donna Harris. I'm CEO of Builders and Backers. I'm glad you could join us today. We're running our capstone event from our summer 2021 cohort of our Idea Accelerator. Today, you're going to hear from 15 people who just a few short months ago came to us with their ideas and a desire to learn how to put them into action. Fast forward to today, and each of them has turned their ideas into a live experiment and run it in the real world. Over the next 90 minutes, you're going to hear directly from each of them as they share the journey they've been on, their ideas, how they tested them, what they learned, and what comes next. But first, let me start with a story. In 1992, a young man was working as a waiter at Red Lobster. In his spare time, he worked on a sewing machine in his mother's basement and began making hats to sell at concerts and neighborhood festivals. A few years later, a different young man was playing football on his college team. Tired of sweating through his t-shirts at practice, he decided to make an undershirt for himself that stayed dry during workouts. And meanwhile, a young woman was trying on her pants in front of the mirror, and she didn't like the way she looked from behind. So she decided to wear her control top pantyhose under her pants, with the feet cut out. These everyday people, people like all of us here, started with a problem they wanted to solve and an idea. Today, we know them as Damon John, founder of FUBU, Kevin Plank, founder of Under Armour, and Sarah Blakely, the founder of Spanx. Every big company and every small business, every nonprofit, every social venture, can really started the same way these people did, with a problem, with an idea, and some small steps to give it a go. Now we wonder at Builders and Backers, what other ideas are out there just waiting to be tried? Yes, only a fraction of them will ever become a global phenomenon like FUBU or Under Armour or Spanx, but every idea matters. They can become companies that create jobs, whether a few or many, they can solve problems, they can be projects that bring a community or a neighborhood together, and that's what our idea accelerator is really designed to do. Unearth ideas, give people an easy, low risk pathway to get started because we don't actually know which ideas will work or scale until we put them into action. So the idea accelerator is designed to start with a rapid 45 day pace education program. So all of our 15 participants have come together for workshops, curriculum and content, mentorship and They've learned the art of experimentation, and then they put what they learned to work on their own ideas, on problems they all care about. Armed with $5,000 from our Pebble Fund and ongoing help from our Builders and Backers team and an array of mentors and volunteers across the country, they've run real world experiments and they've had a chance to see what happens when they put their ideas into action. And then we tell their stories so that others will get inspired to put their own ideas into action creating a cycle of action in our communities. So over the past few months, <clears throat> builders from Tulsa Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma and Oxford, Mississippi have participated in our program. And today is about them. It's about sharing their stories and their journeys. And this cohort and work of this group would nearly not be possible without the help of an array of generous partners. So let's take a minute and thank them. In Tulsa, I want to thank the George Kaiser Family Foundation and the Lobeck Taylor Family Foundation. And in Oxford, thank you to partners, the Oxford Lafayette County Economic Development Foundation, the Oxford Lafayette County Chamber of Commerce, and the University of Mississippi. And in both of these communities and in cities across the heartland, I want to thank our partner, Heartland Forward. They've embraced our entirely new approach to jumpstarting entrepreneurship and problem solving. And they've integrated our program as a cornerstone in their new community growth program and toolkit. So today we're joined by Angie Cooper, Heartland Forward's Chief Program Officer. Angie, welcome. I'd love it if you share a minute about your organization, help the, the folks that have joined us today know more about who you are, your mission in the Heartland and why this program, the Idea Accelerator and the Pebble Fund are so integral to jumpstarting economic growth in the Heartland. Thanks, Donna, for the introduction. For those of you that don't know Heartland Forward, we are a policy think and do tank with a mission of how do we help change the narrative about the middle of the country and kickstart economic growth. We know entrepreneurship and innovation is obviously key to that. And Donna, I know I've told this story a lot, but when we first met, I was struck by your vision and new way of thinking for transforming our country's approach to entrepreneurship and problem solving for communities. 
As I learned more about what you and your team were up to at Builders and Backers, I instantly was excited to partner and for Heartland Forward to put this concept into action in the middle of the country. We obviously know, we talk about it a lot at Heartland Forward, our data and research shows this, that there are significant deficits in the Heartland related to capital and innovation capacity. This poses a very serious challenge to improving future prosperity in the Heartland. We also know though, there are fantastic, smart, creative people with ideas everywhere in the heartland. And as you said earlier, being able to give people and communities that low risk pathway for putting those ideas into action is truly critical. And at Heartland Forward, we've been so very excited to watch this cohort of builders in both Tulsa and Tulsa, Oklahoma and Oxford, Mississippi to do just that. I wanna also echo um, your thanks to our community partners in both of those communities. It, it's been really fascinating to watch um, and learn about the ideas and, and I can't wait for the rest of the group that's listening today to hear a bit more about our builders. But this is why we've made at Heartland Forward the Idea Accelerator and the toolkit being developed by Accenture and the Pebble Fund an integral part of the work that we're doing. And we're excited for other communities across the Heartland to start also offering this to their residents. Um, that is why last week at our National Community Impact Event, uh, Heartland Forward made a commitment to expand what we call our community growth program and toolkit that's growing the idea accelerator and equipping a thousand builders across the heartland with the goal and commitment to raise $4 million to do that over the next two years. We believe this will enable Heartland communities um, to embrace the program and help offset some of the cost of opening it up to their own residents. So for all of the community leaders um, and, and backers and builders from across the Heartland, we hope that you'll join Heartland Forward and Builders and Backers and Accenture in inspiring everyone to become builders. To learn more um, about signing up and to join us along the way, please visit community.heartlandforward.org. We can't wait to engage and learn more about your community. Awesome. Thanks, Angie. And if you noticed the chat down below your screen, there's all kinds of activity going on there. So we'll put the link in that chat box for anybody that didn't catch that. And we'll share it again at the end of today's conversation. So thank you, Angie. We're not only glad you could join us today, but also really thrilled to be partnering with Harlan Forward. Our goal is to really bring this program to communities and to residents and, and people everywhere across the country and in particularly across communities where we really want to jumpstart economic thriving. So we're, we're thrilled to be partnering with you. So now I want to transition to welcoming a special friend of Builders and Backers, Scott Case. Scott, thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me and congratulations on, uh, on everything, including the opportunity to scale this uh, to the next level. That's really exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I mean, speaking of scale, I love your background. Of course, you know, everybody knows and we ourselves lauded it on the invitation that you're the founding CTO of Priceline. And it was just one of a few companies um, at that point to reach a billion dollars in sales in less than 24 months. So that's definitely scale. But, you know, interestingly, you've also led really impactful things that have reached scale. Things like Startup America Partnership, where we worked together you're CEO of Malaria No More, and you're chairman of Network for Good. And I love this about your background because you're a great example of how this, this concept that we call buildership isn't just about creating new ventures. It's also about solving problems that matter. Um, but the thing I personally love the most about you is the way you challenge people, including me, right? You, you have a very unique gift to challenge people and to push them on their ideas and their assumptions and always offer a fresh and, and often counter perspective. So I've, I've really appreciated that throughout our, our friendship. But it's also why we wanted you to come on today because I want to talk to you about experimentation, right? Um, so what, let's start actually with some of the underlying reasons why we do this work. When we first were sharing our vision about getting more people to actually take action on our ideas and when we explained the method we were using, you said that it's really about solving the hope gap 
the idea that we're changing citizen perceptions in their community and their ability to make change. I just would love if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, well, let's first off, thank you for allowing me to challenge you. Um, and uh, I think when you think about taking action, when you unpack why people don't take action, it's usually out of fear. And the fear is of failing, of it not working, of, you know, you can come up with a million reasons not to do something. And so I think that the counter to fear is hope, right? What's possible, what might happen. And if you can focus your energy on, on that hopeful, hey, this could happen, something might change. And then, and I know we're gonna talk more about this, if you frame what you're doing in the form of an experiment, then you can bake the idea that it might fail into it as just one of the outcomes that may happen. And part of the scientific method and the reason you run experiments is to learn from those outcomes, even if they're negative. And if you're set up from the beginning to think of it as a learning exercise, then when you go to take action, you can say, okay, I'm just taking action in an environment where I'm running an experiment. And you can start really, really small and see how it goes. And you'll find that the more you run even very tiny experiments in your own life, when you get positive outcomes, obviously we're all enthusiastic and the endorphin rush is great, but we pr also practice the negative outcomes. And the more that you get used to learning from those negative outcomes, the less risky everything feels, the less that your fear can get in the way of you taking action. And, you know, when you, you gave some good examples, but the many of the things that we enjoy um, in as members of a modern civilization all started usually with a whole series of experiments that nobody talks about that didn't go well. And um, we just don't talk about them. We sort of hide them under the rug or we sort of don't. But the reality is, is that I challenge anyone to go find one that didn't have that. And uh, when you talk to entrepreneurs or scientists, that when you get them either a little inebriated or you get them to be open and honest, um, they'll tell you what those truths are and how challenging it is. And so we've all had them. It's about you know transforming transforming that fear into into both hope and a little being a little courageous um, and taking an action in that way. So yeah. that's how I think about that notion of, of, of activating around being hopeful and accepting that you're not always going to get the outcomes you you want. I love I love that and I love the I love the point about every big idea if you look at the history, not the thing that gets told in the media and the you know videos on YouTube and the stories in the press, but the actual real life conversation. It, failure and experimentation and learnings are threaded throughout, but we want to celebrate the sort of culture of scale, the you know culture of entrepreneurial success and the billion dollar companies and unicorns that we forget that every everything starts with an idea and experimentation. We just really want to teach people how to do that and get people to see that they can get started that way, as opposed to there's this big leap between I have an idea and I have to start something. There's, there's a lot of room between those things. So I love that. So we have been using the word experimentation a lot this morning. Um, we jumped right out of the gate with it. And you know, you and I have talked back to Startup America days about how important experimentation is, especially in the early stages of new ideas and ventures. So before I dig into like the the value of it. Can we talk a little bit about what do we mean by it? I'd love your sense of like, what do you mean when you use the word experimentation? Absolutely. Um, so look, if you think about the, the core definition of an experiment, it's to learn something. It's actually not to achieve anything. A pure experiment is about un un unlocking some amount of knowledge that you can act on or apply at some other point, including feeding into another experiment. So the, the, the elements are basically define a hypothesis, which sounds like a big complicated idea, but it's basically like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, what, what do you believe is true? So an experiment could be with a hypothesis could be, I believe that this community actually has this problem, right? So that could be the first hypothesis. I believe our community has, you know, a, uh, a challenge with, uh, uh, homeless people with mental illness. Okay, now you may be an expert in that field, but 
if you define that as your first hypothesis, now you got to basically design your experiment. Well, how are you going to validate that that's true or not true? And then how will you measure it at the end to know that it was? Does that mean going and interviewing 25 people? Is it going and talking to other experts? And then the last step is to evaluate what you did and learn from it and decide, hey, did you validate your hypothesis? In which case you could move on to the, the next level of, of decision-making you need to make. Or, hey, I invalidated it. It actually isn't what I thought it was. And um, now I need to adjust and run another experiment. And I think that a lot of people skip the thinking step of really defining those things. It doesn't have to be it, literally those comp any more complicated than that, right? And I would challenge anybody who's uh, who's here or a part of builders and backers, or frankly, anybody just living their life, if you just step back and you, you could probably do it in about 15 minutes for most experiments. And if you if you view them that way, as I said earlier, when you get an outcome that didn't match your hypothesis, you didn't fail. The hypothesis wasn't true. This subject objective thing that you defined up front. And so now you can evaluate it like a scientist would. And so it just, it separates out your personal emotional attachment to whatever it is to being a little more clinical about it. It doesn't mean you can't be emotional about wanting to get after it and put your energy into, you know, proving things that are true, but it does create a little bit of space for yourself. And I think one of the things that entrepreneurs, especially first timers or people that are really passionate, and I see this in the social sector all the time, is they don't deeply fall in love with the problem they're trying to solve, to really deeply understand it. We often jump immediately to some solution that we're excited about. I can tell you from, a, from I don't know, 30 plus years of experience that your first solutions are probably more likely to be wrong than right. But if you fall in love with the problem, it doesn't matter, right? I'm in love with the problem. So I'm just gonna keep working on solutions until I find one that sort of is the fit for whatever I'm trying to solve for. So those steps, hypothesis, a design step, some kind of way of measuring and then learning from it to decide what your next step is. And those cycles can be really fast when you're first starting. You could do an experiment a day. Um, and as you get further along and they get more complex, they might take weeks or months, but you're still using the same concept. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I love that. And you're hitting on the fundamental reason why we teach this, right? Because it's a it's a foreign concept. We find that when we talk about this in communities, um, we aren't talking about startups this way. We aren't talking about taking action on ideas this way. And um, this falling in love with our solution really is problematic because we end up with people trying to raise money for things that actually haven't done any experimentation to know if that thing is actually valid. And we have people who aren't taking action because they feel like their first step is really too big. You know, I love when we think about the value at this sort of, especially this early stage, you know, can you poke a little bit more at the, the, the not taking action on bad ideas thread? And then I'd love to poke in on the, it actually doesn't cost a whole lot to run these experiments, but let's come back to that point in a second. Look, I think that if you establish a hypothesis for what you believe to be true, and then and then you you test it, so that's the design phase, right? You have to figure out, okay, well, how will I know? A couple of things happen. First off, you gain confidence, right, when you get the results that you expect, or it it basically teaches you that says, oh, I got to go in a different direction because inevitably just by running the experiment, you're going to learn information that's going to guide you that you didn't have before. And I think that when you, if you frame it so that taking that first step is, is more like you're an investigator in it, you, when you take the action step to go learn something, you're not putting yourself out there. You're not taking the risk to say, I'm going to go open the new blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm going to start a restaurant or I'm going to go do a, I'm going to go start a new after school program, right? You, you, you can start with smaller steps. And when you start to build an evidence base up that you've crafted the problem that's worth solving, you have an evidence base to go talk to other people and bring them along. So you de-risk the kind of social awkwardness or pressure because when you say, I'm going to go do X, and somebody says, well, you can't do that, you actually can turn and say, no, 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 you don't understand. I've talked to 72 people, and 30 of them, you're absolutely right. They didn't get it. 
but there were 42 that, boy, let me tell you, they were willing to pay money for it, or they were willing to invest in it, or they were willing to teach me more about it, whatever it was. So that evidence base gives you more confidence that you're moving in the right direction. You may have still a long way to go on the solution, but you'll have validated the problem that it's worth working on. And I think that so many people get sucked into falling in love with their solution that they, they haven't fully figured out that the problem itself may or be big enough to work on or may be impactful enough to work on. And they toil away for months or years grinding on something that wasn't going to matter anyway, even if you were successful at it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that I've thought a lot about over the last decade or so is working on things that are worth failing at, which sounds counterintuitive, but the idea that I've defined the problem so that even if I fail at the solution, it was worth getting after. Because otherwise, you know, you wasted your time. But at least if you failed at something that was worthy, it was worth doing. Yeah. There's a hunk of metal. I think I have it around here somewhere that um, that I got from a friend of mine that says uh, something really annoying on it. What would you attempt to do if you knew you could not fail? And so if you frame the problems you go after within that context, like I'm going to work on things that are worth working on that um, that that if I knew I couldn't fail, I would change the world. I would dent the universe with this stuff. So picking your problem and making sure you're, work, you're falling in love with it and you're working on it, and then you run experiments to keep validating it, both de-risks it, and it basically makes sure that you're spending your time on something that's worthy of it. Yeah, I love that. And, and it's funny because I was just having this conversation with uh, a friend of mine that, you know, for me, it has been falling in love with the problem. The problem I care about is how do we get more people across the country seeing that entrepreneurial thinking and doing is a pathway for personal empowerment, creating jobs, solving problems, right? Like how do we, how do we make that happen? And it's been a problem that I've been in love with for two decades. So let's make this real for people. So, you know, you are, you have been a, an entrepreneur and a builder in all sorts of different formats and, and structures. Give us an example of an experiment you've run in your own startup or where you've seen in your travels and how doing those small tests made a difference. Yeah, so we, um, I use one from Network for Good that has a blend of commercial and social. So Network for Good, for those of you who don't know it, is a, um, it's a software as a service platform for small charities. And um, it's, it, I don't know, its flagship product is a donor management solution. But it wasn't always that way. About, I'm going to get the timeline right wrong, about five years ago, we had a suite of products that didn't include any kind of donor management. If you think of donor management, it's like a customer relationship management for, for nonprofits and donors. And we knew that this was a gap in the marketplace, but we didn't have the capital or resources and we, didn't, we weren't confident that we had the right, the right product fit. So the product team and, and the board got behind them and said, why don't you run some early experiments? And so the first set of experiments were about just validating that the small nonprofits, what were they doing today? It turns out the vast majority of them were using uh, on their best day spreadsheets. And a lot of them were just like little, literally pieces of paper stacked up. We said, okay, so there's clearly a problem out there and we validated it in that way. But then we said, well, a full donor management suite is really complicated. So what if we were to become a reseller of a donor management solution that somebody else had already built? And let's go make sure that we understand how to market and sell this solution. That led us down the path, once we got enough success there, to actually go and build our own donor management solution that we could then take to scale. And it is the flagship product now. Now, if we hadn't been brave enough back at the beginning to do some early experiments to figure out, all right, how big is that market? How important is it to our current client base? Um, and then run a series of experiments, frankly, with somebody else's product that we de-risked the cost of it. We didn't make nearly as much money, but it didn't matter. It wasn't about that. It was about making sure that we we're going in a direction that was worth investing our resources in. And there were lots of things along the way, even when we created our own product, a series of experiments that we ran. One of the, probably one of the biggest was trying to understand best about when nonprofits were really ready to use a tool like we had. And we ran a series of experiments that taught us that if you don't already have 100 donors, you can't use any of our software. It's just too hard. You're not ready for it yet. Those were hard won experiments along that route. And while Network for Good is an established company, that, that process is kind of embedded. And if you bake it into who you are, then it just becomes the normal way you do stuff around here. Um, the last thing I'll tell you about is just very quickly, 
um, at, at Upside, my last startup, we were trying to make a pivot. And one of the questions we had was whether our product was ready for a, a, a specific customer segment. And I set our team about going out and getting a hundred no's. Their job was not to get yeses. Their job was to go talk to a bunch of people we thought were in our segment and get them to tell us no and why we weren't ready for them. And if, it took about two or three days for people to understand why I wanted no's. I wanted all the objections. Getting yeses just makes you feel good. Getting no's actually teaches you stuff, right? And so it was about pushing things to a place where people got no's. Now, we ended up with a bunch of yeses along the way, but you know, of the 80 that said no, we figured out that you know, 50 of those weren't ever our customers anyway, that we were never gonna be their, their solution. So sometimes you know, your hypothesis is you know, you're looking for a negative outcome and so you could force yourself there, which, which you'll more likely to learn a lot more from. Yeah, that's awesome. And you know, the thing I love about those examples too is they're not expensive, right? Like, especially with today's digital tools and no code platforms and things where you can get free trials experimentation can be done really, really inexpensively and quickly. You don't need to run a lot of, raise a lot of money to run an experiment, or you didn't I'll, even build I'll, the product. To build I'll the take product. it a step, I'll take it a step further. I tell most entrepreneurs, you have one of these, you have a phone, get some sticky notes, you can even use scrap paper and some kind of a writing implement. You can implement most early experiments for almost any kind of company on earth with those things. Because most of what you need to do when you run your early experiments is to discover the problem. Does anybody have this problem? That's just having a bunch of conversations, right? And it can start with the people around you, like literally like go, you know, people at your supermarket or at your church or, you know, that are in your kids' little league standing on the sideline with you. You know, you can have those early conversations to discover whether the problem you think is out there in the world, anybody else believes that the problem, forget everything else. What's the problem? And that doesn't cost very much. Yeah, you have to have a, you have to have a cell phone pen, but my goodness, you have a supercomputer in your pocket. Um, it's absolutely worth the investment and pen and paper are usually pretty inexpensive. So you can start there. You can do more with more sophisticated tools and landing pages and all that shit. But I have to tell you that I find people getting caught up in it in a way that's not helpful to them because it avoids the hard thinking work, right? I'm, oh, I'm working on my landing page, who cares? That's right. right. How about you just like text somebody and ask them, right? You, you, you'll, you'll gain a lot from doing that. And I think too many people jump to the solution space, even for their experiments way too early in the process. And um, people may say I'm a little old school, but it's through trial and error and lots of, you know, scars. So trust my scars. <laughs> I love it. Well, you know, you're speaking my love language. People thought we were crazy when we said we would give people only $5,000 to run an experiment. And Kathleen and I, have said to ourselves, Kathleen, our COO, have said to ourselves, they don't need anywhere near five thousand dollars to actually do really, really rapid, you know, first few experiments at the idea stage. But we're going to save some of that for another longer conversation when we hopefully have you back soon for uh, a conversation when we have more time. Scott, I really, you know, I, I think people have seen just a snippet of why I love inviting you in for these kinds of conversations. So really appreciate you joining us today. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me and congrats to everybody on uh, getting your experiments going. And um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you all do next. So again, thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks. So there is enormous power in trying small things in low risk ways and seeing what works, but you don't have to take my word for it. You have to take Scott's word for it. Let's actually hear directly from our builders. So here's what we're going to do. We have uh, five short rounds think of them as lightning rounds. You're going to first see a video of some of our builders, and then you will hear in those videos, their individual stories. From then, you will meet them in short discussions facilitated by James Atkins, our, build, our builder in residence, our Kathleen Hale, who I mentioned, our COO, and Katie Milligan, program manager from Heartland Forbes, is going to join us as well. So without further ado, let's meet our builders. I believe that education is a right and that every student deserves guidance, even if college isn't going to be their end game. I'm Terry Shipley, and I'm a builder from Tulsa, Oklahoma. There is about 450 to one student to counselor ratio nationally, and here in Oklahoma, it's about double that. You just have students who feel completely lost and stressed and overwhelmed, and uh, I, I think it's a really big problem. I'm trying to democratize high quality guidance for college and career to every student. My experiment is to have 
an app for students to complete where their data inputs would then generate a game plan for them to have customized guidance for the college and career process to help them feel like they've got this, that they can do this on their own. I've been working with a coder on this app to try to get students to give us feedback as to whether this is helpful to them. And then that way we'd be able to take it eventually to investors to say, hey, this is actually helpful and students would sign up for this. Having a Pebble grant from builders and backers was really helpful for me to say, okay, well, what could I do to really understand how to make this experiment work? Yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the click-through rate is. Having the opportunity to test it has been incredible and I'm really grateful to builders and backers for that. My name is Annika and I'm a builder from Tulsa, Oklahoma. The modern food system is designed so that we don't know where our food comes from. Most of us walk into a grocery store and we see the packaged goods on the shelves and most of the food that's inside that bears no resemblance to what it looked like when it was grown. My initial idea for the experiment was to host a marketplace of plants and animal products that are native to Oklahoma. The Builders and Backers program has really pushed me to reach out to so many different people that I, I don't know if I would have reached out to on my own. I realized that my first idea of, of having a market was not commercially viable at this time for what I really wanted. So I decided to build an online resource called Sumac Collective. I was very surprised that something like this didn't exist. Seeing my site live, being able to type in the URL and just seeing all that information there felt so fantastic. There's still a long ways to go, but knowing that something that when I first came to Oklahoma and I had been looking for now exists because I, I helped just put it out there is, yeah, a fantastic feeling. Such great stories. Hi everyone, I'm James Atkin from Builders and Backers. We believe ideas exist everywhere. We all have them, but too few of us take action on them. We're out to change that. And I'm pleased to introduce the conversation, Terry and Annika, who have done just that in this program. Hey Terry, thanks for being here today. Happy to be here. Let's talk about Apply You and how the Pebble Fund helped push you to do things that you may not have tried otherwise. Uh, sure. So I had actually participated in a couple of other um, accelerators prior to that that didn't have any financial components. So while there was some accountability, there wasn't, I guess, quite enough for me. Um, and so I, uh, I appreciated the ability to try to be a good steward of the money. And, um, and so that, that prompted me to kind of keep iterating and pivoting um, as my experiment kept like morphing uh, due to COVID. Um, as, as recently as like this Monday, we've just pivoted again. And so um, I, I like to think that I'm a good steward of my own money, but I'm an even better steward of somebody else's. And uh, I, I, yeah, so it was, it was just having that small, um, that small pebble grant that helped me to see, okay, I, you know, I can really do this. There are people that are holding me accountable. Um, and, and yeah, it's, I, I could come up with a million excuses as to why I don't have the time to do this and to keep doing this. Um, you know, there are two in my household, one's five and one is four, and uh, you know, they'll, they'll keep me busy enough. But, um, you know, I, I, I wanna just say thank you uh, to Builders and Backers for allowing me that opportunity. There's a lot of iterations you did in your experiment, a lot of back and forth you and your coder have done. Well, what are one or two of them you've learned in this program that actually you're kind of looking at how do you expand on from there? Um, let me clarify, so like, a a most recent kind of pivot that yeah, was trying yeah. to work. Yeah, uh, so I was thinking initially, and the video captured this well, I, I wanna have like more comprehensive college guidance. And I was thinking that initially, if, we, if I put out that comprehensive college guidance, that, that that'll be great. But um, students are operating on TikTok time and they just <laughs> don't seem to have the initial um, patience or trust or buy-in to complete an assessment that would take even you know three to five minutes, and so I'm trying to lean on 
um, you know, the BuzzFeed kind of format that they're so used to, to try to just have a snippet of that guidance to try to get them to see, okay, this is really helpful for me. If I want to dive in further, let me click on this, you know, career counseling module or what have you. What was the hardest part? Obviously you had some grand goals that were kind of blown up by COVID in terms of, you know, PTA meetings and really being with students. You know, what did you find that worked, you know, well in terms of trying to control for that? Um, just being able to have the access to student emails um, and parent emails to just directly communicate to them and see who is interested rather than um, bank on the, the fact that prior to the new COVID regulations for 2021 to 2020, uh, outside people can't come into Tulsa public schools, you know, and so I would definitely be considered outside. So while while we had plans with the principals to come to a pizza party, that's just not going to happen. So um, and it's also, as Kathleen had mentioned uh, previously, a way for me to be able to scale this pilot um, and the experiment to see, okay, if we can just directly contact these people through email, um, how quickly can we grow? Yeah, great. Well, Annika, bringing you in here, I'd love your take on how the Idea Accelerator helps idea people do things more tangible. I think that's like one of the pieces we talked a lot about. So I'd love you to kind of expand on that. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's what um, Terry and Scott were talking about. It's the easiest part is coming up with an idea of you know what sort of world you'd like to live in, what, how you how you want to fix all these problems that you see around. Um, the hard part is actually taking the small steps to get there, and that's why I am so grateful for builders and backers and the idea accelerator because it provides that <laughs> accountability. Um, you know, we have to have regular check ins with you, and it it really forces you to look at what is possible today what is something you know given the climate things like COVID pop up but you know what is actually something that you can do today this month next month to take these tangible steps towards building building our visions yeah and i think you know as we talked about i think your work on trying to kind of support small farmers and help them grow and and so forth is so critical i mean you just see it in our food supply issues right now we're having and, and so forth what do you see as the kind of the next big step for you now you've kind of rolled out sumac in in um, tulsa what's next along those lines you're going to focus on um like like scott was saying it's great that we all have technology in our pockets now and so you know having these online resources where people who are interested in supporting better food systems can just log on with you know just by opening up their phone and looking and seeing what sorts of foods grow natively around them you know who the producers are i think that's a really great resource and so i would love to expand sumac from just northeast oklahoma to a couple other cities around the country. Um, it'd be great to have it in every region across the country. Um, just a resource where you can see, you know, what what food grows really well in your area. And, and you're who's growing about, it. Yeah, you're thinking about trying to do this in terms of helping not only people find small farmers to buy from, but helping small farmers actually find land, find resources, find what actually they can grow in, in that community, right? Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, in an era of grocery stores, it's really hard for, for small producers to compete with producers who have a, abundant resources, abundant land. Um, so just giving them a platform to be able to share what they're doing uh, is really at the heart of Sumac Collective. What was the, what was the most interesting product you met or what most interesting kind of uh, person you met during your research in Tulsa who's growing something interesting? That's too hard of a question because each one of them has a really unique story. Um, I, I mean, I personally, I love that bison is becoming a, a bigger part of our food system again. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's one of the most beautiful parts about Oklahoma is driving by these beautiful bison herds. So I'm really glad that there's been a focus on reviving them. Absolutely. Well, that's great. Well, thank you for both for sharing us today. Unfortunately, we have, you know, five other groups to go through, uh, but these are such great examples in many ways of how we're all idea people. We just need a little help sometimes to become action people. So now just imagine how many Terry's and Annika's there are out there with ideas just waiting to be tried. Now let's hear from more of our builders. I'm Joe Sinchcombe and I'm a builder from Oxford, Mississippi. I've been working in the cocktail industry for about 10 years now, and I'm opening a cocktail bar in Oxford called Bar Muse. We're gonna show them right here for wine stores. There's well. no blueprint on how to be a black entrepreneur, especially in Oxford. 
my experiment was to help shine light on black entrepreneurs and black entrepreneurship in Lafayette County and Oxford. I did it through the one thing that I am halfway decent at, which is restaurants. We decided to have a talk and then a sit down dinner, getting those resources to black entrepreneurs, getting them in the right room with people who have these resources and have the, the money to invest in these projects. The experiment just started naturally um, by sitting out and talking to other black entrepreneurs and seeing what they needed. And the experiment went way better than I would have ever imagined it to be. Now we're actually gonna be state funded. So if one person goes to this dinner and finds an angel investor and their business is success, then the project is success. The experiment worked. It's already happened. Builders and Backers definitely helped me look at this from a business mindset, which I wanna helpfully teach other people how to get better at. I've always wanted to help my community for the better. I think anyone should leave it better than they found it. As I grow as an entrepreneur now, why not share my little experience with people to help them grow as an entrepreneur? I always knew I wanted to be a scientist and an astronomer. I didn't see anybody that looked like me doing it. I really want to be able to inspire young minority communities through my passion for astronomy. My name is Cheyenne Smith, and I'm a builder from Tulsa, Oklahoma. A lot of people don't realize that they have this passion for space until they see that dark sky with all those celestial objects and they see the Milky Way. They don't know that they have this passion until they're introduced to it. I started doing star parties around Tulsa. Everybody brings their telescopes, their binoculars, and they go out and we just stargaze, and people loved it. That's why I started this project, to build a mobile observatory. The mobile observatory, it's a trailer, it's nothing fancy right now, but what I'm hoping for is to have a whole astronomical experience inside and on the outside. I'm bringing science to you Literally. I was really excited when I got the Builders and Backers Grant because it was reassuring that this is something that is needed in Tulsa. I want it to be right in your face, that this is here, this is your resource, I can be your resource. Let's get to the stars. I'm Chantel. And I'm Janelle. And, and we're, we're Builders. builders. We complement each other. She's the creative and I am the entrepreneur. Our experiment is called Black Tandem. We want to create a platform, a service where we can match creatives and entrepreneurs together so that they can work together and build together. We specifically are focusing on the BIPOC community because we feel like the experiences of people of color differ. This is our matchmaking process. Personality, how well they're gonna mesh, and then also, the business needs. What can the creative provide that can meet the entrepreneur's needs? What I've learned from builders and backers is that it's okay to start over. It's okay to make mistakes. Uh, that's a part of the process and it's an important part of the process. My hopes and dreams for Black Tandem is that we're able to scale and apply Black Tandem all over the country. We can go together a lot faster as a community when we are building together as a community. Wow, I love all the variety in the experiments in this cohort, it's so cool to see. Hi everyone, my name is Kathleen. I'm with Builders and Backers. We heard earlier from Donna and from Scott about how just doing a small experiment can have such a big impact. And in these videos and the experiments that are being highlighted, we're already seeing that happen. I mean, a dinner party, a star party, look at the ripple effects that they're having in the community. So let's get some more detail on those experiments. Joe, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you guys doing? Good. I'm not going to lie. The cocktail that you made in your video it looked pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So cocktails, restaurant business, that's your area of expertise. That's your specialty. And you mentioned that you wanted to lean into that in doing your experiment. And I love that idea. You, you, you came into our program saying you want to use food to bring people together. And that could have gone in a lot of different directions. So can you tell us how you ended up landing on the idea for the Equitable Entrepreneurship Networking Dinners? Uh, well, I, use, I wanted to use food because I think food is such an intimate part of 
we have such an intimate relationship with food. Um, and to bring people together over food to me, I think is a really good way to connect and bond with people. Um, because if you're able to share, break bread, literally break bread with someone, you'll be able to kind of talk about ideas and talk money with someone, right? If you can share a plate of food with someone, I think it's like the basis of just human interactions. Like here's a plate of food to show that we have some camaraderie no matter what. And to me having a dinner with that, I think was a good baseline to have, you know, bigger and grander talks. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned in the video that you received some state funding. How did that come about? Uh, one of the one of the uh, donors that we invited, um, she came and had a wonderful time and said, "This is these are actually people doing everyday work in the community to make their community better." Um, so she talked to the Secretary of State of Mississippi, and um, within twelve hours, we got state funding to do this again. Hopefully in January, depending on where I am with Farm Use, but January is probably where we're shooting to do it again. Awesome. Congrats, Joe. We know you'll keep us posted to Thank you. share about your next dinner. Cheyenne, let's turn to you. Cheyenne, you are such an idea person. I mean, the star party ideas, just in our program, you had ideas from subscription boxes for freeze-dried ice cream to behind the scenes tours of planetariums. Can you talk about how you see those ideas helping you with your overall goal of bringing the Mobile Observatory to Tulsa? So um, having a, well, I experimented a lot um, and had to pivot a lot. Um, so having a, a science background, of course, experimentation is like the foundation for solving a problem. So in a business sense, uh, I feel like it's similar in my opinion, because you're trying to like identify like a pain point and come up with like creative ways to find a solution for, you know, your target audience. And it either works or it doesn't and you move on to the next or you evolve or you evolve from something that did work and with experimentation it, it allowed um it allows you to like launch a minimal viable product which is kind of like what i did with <clears throat> the star parties or like a lo-fi service without high cost and um that can you know of course like uh we were talking about earl earlier it helps validate your mission so being a small project uh and like doing those free star parties and launching the fundraising campaign to engage like interest ended up being very reassuring for me that this is something that is needed like I mentioned in the video and also like experimentation has allowed me to identify a loyal audience uh, a bit more and has allowed them to actually grow with me and uh, and with that like my audience and the interest in the project um it continues to grow and I'm confident that I will be able to launch this project soon. So hopefully star parties <laughs> will be here by the end of the year, hopefully. That's awesome. Really leaning into what Scott was saying earlier, you know, find those core group of people, those initial mm -hmm. people who are your, can be your biggest fans and your early adopters. And uh, Cheyenne's mobile observatory is a big project. It is going to involve a 3D printed dome and, and going to be incredibly outfitted. Um, she is uh, continuing to raise money on a GoFundMe campaign to be able to finish her observ observatory. So look for that link in the chat if you want to support, support Cheyenne's work. Thanks so much, Cheyenne. Thank you. Chantel and Janelle, you came to us working together. Hello, welcome. Um, you know, each time we talk to you, both of you, your experiment, it changed a little bit, but not just for no reason, you had data coming in, you were really learning from that, like you took that part of the idea accelerator to heart. What was one of the biggest surprises along the way that caused your experiment to evolve? The actual needs of the entrepreneurs, we assumed, and going back to what Scott talked about earlier, we had, we, 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 were, we were focused on the solution, but we also were focused on the problem at heart, and that was is what kept us motivated to change some things around to actually meet the needs of the entrepreneurs um, and matching them with the creatives that came on board. So keeping that problem at heart is what helped us pivot throughout the experiment. That's fantastic. Janelle, what, what comes next for Black Tandem? We have been surprised by the cohort's uh, passion and even a push for Chantel and I to, to do more, to expand. So she and I are gonna be turning inward and looking at ways to strengthen Black Tandem uh, for possible future funding 
and continuing to engage the folks that are in our cohort. We have our own mini capstone this evening where uh, the folks that were in the cohort are going to be sharing out what they were able to accomplish through their matches. And so um, next steps is onward and upward. That's awesome. Well, it's a big day for you all. <laughs> capstone here and another capstone tonight. And what's great is, you know, seeing this cycle of you're all here learning in the idea accelerator out there helping other entrepreneurs in the community. That's, that's great. We look forward to hearing what's next with Black Tandem. Thank you all so much. Um, you know, as we, you know, we hear from Janelle and Chantel in particular on that experimentation is an iterative process. We are always learning from experiment to experiment. And we're excited to see how the builders are taking that to heart and putting it into action for the next steps on their work. All right, it's time to hear from our next round of amazing builders. The stigma of men not being able to talk about their emotions and their problems at home, mental health, is something that we have to tackle one podcast at a time, one conversation at a time. Welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Real Men. I'm your host, Josh McGlawn. I'm a builder from Oxford, Mississippi. I grew up here in Oxford, have a business here, raising a family here. I believe in this community. The idea kind of came from men don't really have a safe space to talk about stuff. We take the mask off, we just say, hey, this is what a man is supposed to do. We can open up, it's okay to open up. If we build that environment of transparency and truth, then everybody else will follow suit. And they'll say, okay, you know, I can see that he's being real right now. I can, I can feel that. And deal with your issues, because I only came on here to be transparent, so you don't have to go through what I went through. With Heartland Forward, I, I feel like we put the booster cables to this thing and kick the battery off. And they're not just telling me, hey, here's the money. They're saying, hey, this is a good idea. Take it and run with it. The plan for the future is to take what we have built so far in the last year and push it to the next level for generations to come. This is my studio where I sew, I teach lessons in here, and I make all kinds of stuff in here. I'm Andy Bedsworth, and I'm a builder from Oxford, Mississippi. My experiment is to see if we could develop a trade school for sewing. I think sewing probably was a dying trade. Now you're starting to see a great resurgence. Having taught at the university level, I can see that there is a gap in what college has to offer. And I think we need to have other options. There's some really great programs that I think could come out of this. I would love to see it grow into other trades. So just clip it around the curves, okay? Through Heartland Forward and Builders and Backers, I was able to receive a lot of resources and invaluable training. They paired me up with people that would be helpful in my field. That was phenomenal. I am kind of really more of a business person now because of that. More of a business person now because of that. I love that. Empowering people to take action. I'm excited to be joined by Josh, Andy, and Kristen to talk about experimentation as a form of learning. Experiments mean you don't have to guess or hope an idea works. We can try it in quick, simple, low cost, low risk ways and actually see and measure what happens before investing time and money. So we say repeatedly throughout the program that failure is just a data point. So, hey, Josh, good to see you. What's up, James? I think what was so interesting about Real Talk was the extent you experimented within your experiment. You tried different models, different formats. Some of them worked and some of them didn't work as well as you hoped they would work. What did you learn from one of those experiments that didn't work the way you hoped it would? Uh, so uh, you come in thinking you're just gonna do something a certain way and you, you're trying to reach a certain, uh, you want not just quantity, but quality along with it. And when I realized that I wasn't getting as many uh, responses on my surveys, because I was like, oh, my gosh, I got to get more responses so I can get data to bring back. And they're going to look at me like you didn't do anything. You're just having fun with videos. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. 
but I had to realize that I had to trust the process. It, it wasn't, it wasn't just about uh, what, how many surveys that I'm getting It's about what information that I can get from those surveys. So I could focus a lot more on the, the content of the answers. Uh, you know, are people really uh, getting something from my videos? Are they getting something from the messages that were, that were bringing and the people that were bringing on and it, it, they are, I mean, it's, it was overwhelming how many people really either sustained their uh, positive outlook on life or improved it uh, just by watching one of our videos. Uh, and th there were, you know, just a handful of people that were still struggling, but that lets me know that there are still people out there that need help. Absolutely. So what's next for Real Talk now moving forward? So next, I mean, it's kind of turned into, and I give my 30 second elevator pitch to everybody that I talk to. And it started out as a podcast, turned into a community program. And now it's like multiple businesses. I mean, you're talking about life coaching, speaking, media production. I mean, it's all just blossomed uh, to so many different things. And that's kind of how I am. I'm a jack of all trades. I just do so many different things. And uh, my wife's looking at me like, you're doing too much. So, I, <laughs> so I'm trying to focus on stuff that works, you know, stuff that, uh, you know, I learned, take what I learned from this show, you know, put it out to more people. So yeah, people, yeah. more people can see it and, and, you know, get the message across the country and maybe the world. Totally, totally. Well, Andy, let's turn to you on this one, because I think you came in with an idea and didn't really work. But instead of quitting and saying, OK, it failed. I am clearly not cut out for this. You pivoted. I think that's like a really important lesson for builders everywhere is that, you know, as we talked about in the past, that's kind of how this process works. So tell us a little bit about how you came in with your one idea and then kind of pivoted as your data changed. Yeah, so my idea originally was to start a trade school for sewing. Um, and I really wanted to have factories that were partnerships with us. And so basically the idea was that they would go through a training um, of sewing with me and some other teachers. And then we would funnel them into sort of internships with companies of factories and they would do a you know an internship with this factory to kind of learn the factory trade and the factory sewing on industrial machines and that concept and that kind of way of working and then they would be job ready you know they could go either into those factories and be hireable by those factories or they would have real life job experience so that then they could, you know, get jobs in other factories. And the more I started doing the experiments, the more I realized I was having a hard time getting into factories. And I also was realizing that as I was talking to people that maybe that wasn't really what people wanted to learn. And maybe that wasn't really what I wanted to teach people. Like maybe I wanted to give people more, like I want, sewing is at the heart of it, right? I, the sewing piece is still there, but maybe I want them to have more of the entrepreneurial skills to create their own sewing business. So maybe they could work in a factory if they wanted to, but maybe they could also start their own business, you know, whether that's an alterations shop or an Etsy store or their own small factory, you know, or maybe it's a cohort of people where we're, you know, we're manufacturing our own, you know, stuff for another company or other companies, but we're working as contract workers or, you know, um, so there's all kinds of different ideas that started playing out of it. Like maybe we could empower these people to be their own bosses as well as having the sewing skills and not just working in factories as piece workers. I love that. Well, hey, Kristen, let's bring you in here. Unfortunately, due to some scheduling conflicts, we don't have a video for you, but it's in the works. Um, but there's an article in the, in the chat that kind of gives a little more information on what um, Kristen was working on. But your goal was to really try and get local businesses that aren't online, don't have a digital footprint, onto Google. Your theory was getting them onto Google would help them grow their businesses. And this is part of a larger interest you have in supporting BIPOC businesses that I know we're all excited to see you continue. So I'd love to hear you talk about some of your struggles actually engaging these businesses and kind of what you learned from that that's going to influence your kind of going process going forward. Yeah. So um, this idea kind of started just from some volunteer work in the community. And 
um, looking back, you know, hindsight is 2020, right? I guess I had already been kind of experimenting to see what were, would work. Um, so the challenge is um, the north side of our town tends to be, um, have a negative perception about it um, in some circles. And so um, we tried media monitoring. We looked at rebranding. Um, we looked at even a business directory, um, web design, and then most recently um, in this idea accelerator with builders and backers is how do we get businesses Googleable? And so Google Maps provides a free tool called Google My Business. And the idea was there are so many businesses in our community, um, but we're just, we're not finding them online. Um, and to be honest, we're, these businesses don't necessarily even have storefronts. Um, whereas in the past, if you were going to register your business on Google, you had to have a storefront. Now you can just list a service area, which is really great for our entrepreneurs that are working out of their home, or maybe this is like a part-time thing that they're doing um, before you know launching full-time. Um, and so we did a couple of pop-up events. Um, Originally, the goal was to have maybe 25 to get 25 businesses registered. And even that, I thought, you know, it's really low. We had 18 business owners show up across the two events. And um, this, the second event, um, the first guy that came in, he made a comment to me. And he's like, you know, if I hadn't seen this on the news, I wouldn't have known about it. And so um, that, in addition to other things that I'll try to quickly share with you, um, was just really eye-opening for me. Um, we already knew that our community um, adopts technology slower than um, maybe the rest of the area. And so um, we looked at offering a cash prize. So, hey, if you come to our pop-up event and learn about getting your business online, you could be entered to win a $500 cash prize. And despite that offering, we still had a low turnout. Yeah. Um, well, and, so, and sorry, Chris, I hate to cut you off, but we you yeah. know, obviously want to make sure we get the rest of the builders. But I think we're going to put some stuff in the chat on, that kind of talks more about your experiment. But yeah, I think that that's a great part of kind of what you learned in this process going forward. Yeah. Um, so with that, I think it's, you know, we're, it's been great to share you know, those stories with all of you. I think it's, what you learn here is it's hard to wrap your head around what experiment actually is until you try it. That's what we don't just teach by experiments. We give pebble funds and actually help builders run experiments. It isn't so much whether your experience is a success or a failure. It's actually running an experiment that's the greatest teacher and it's a school that anyone can learn. So with that, let's hear from a few more of our builders. I'm Jackie Gonzalez and I'm a builder from Tulsa, Oklahoma. I've done a lot of economic development um, and workforce development in Tulsa. And I thought, oh, we have this amazing art scene. Is there a way to connect the two? With my project, Regenerate Reimagine, I invited artists to take over a vacant storefront and reimagine it with the premise of restaurants. The goal was for people to have a sense of awareness of opportunities that exist and of concepts that people want to bring into their neighborhood. So when someone walks by, they'll see a mural and they have a QR code where they can learn more about ways as a community member, they might be able to plug in in advocating for these certain concepts or become business owners themselves. When I walk down the street and see that art, it's really exciting to me because it's honestly a reflection of what could be. As part of this experiment, I'm hoping to really create a blueprint for cities that are interested in adopting this type of exercise in their communities. Working with the Heartland Builders and Backers team, I've really valued the sense of camaraderie and support and coaching that they have provided for me. I feel like I'm walking away with a plethora of resources, an amazing network to help me continue to explore my ideas. I'm just really excited about the possibilities ahead. Hi, I'm Steve McDavid and I'm a builder from Oxford, Mississippi. The Time Bank is a membership organization that through a software package allows you to provide services to others and earn credits which you can use to employ other members of the organization. So in a community that has 
both poor and wealthy members, it becomes a us and them. And most volunteer opportunities you have out there, it's me helping you. And there's a stigma that goes along with being the person in need of help. So by being part of a membership organization and valuing the fact that everyone has something to give and to give back, then I think it does away with that stigma and also builds community between people of different backgrounds, financial backgrounds or other ones. I mean, I love doing entrepreneurship. And that's one thing that the foundation has allowed me to do is to come up with a new crazy idea, give it a try, give it a test, and see where it goes, which is a wonderful place to be in. I'm Tammy Harrod, and I am a builder from Oxford, Mississippi. So my Builders and Backers experiment was to develop a six-week program to help build entrepreneurship for my community. In doing so, the hope was that each participant would be able to take away information from the six-week sessions to start their business, to launch their business, or decide they don't want to do business. I think women entrepreneurs just need somebody to put a fire under them. I, they need somebody to encourage them. They need to see other women doing it. A lot of times people don't do it out of fear or not having money. So if we had somebody to back some of my participants, I feel like their business could grow and flourish and become great in this community and make a difference in our economy. I had the idea. I was working the idea, but I was working the idea with my money. And thank God for Builders and Backers, they have allowed me to really move it forward. And I tell you, it has made a difference. And I thank them daily. <laughs> I mean, if you educate yourself, yes, no one can take that no away. No one can take that away from you. It's not just me. I also have other people in the community who are mentors and sharing information. But because, you know, I had somebody backing me, it gave me an opportunity to step out in faith. And so that's what I did. In all these videos, you've heard everyone saying, hi, I'm Tammy. Hi, I'm Steve. I'm a builder. Donna mentioned earlier that we purposefully use the words builder and buildership instead of entrepreneur and entrepreneurship. And the reason for this is that we found the term entrepreneur, it's become a bit loaded. It is typically associated with profit, high growth, unicorns, venture capital. And so people can hear that word entrepreneur and they think, no, that's not me. That doesn't describe me. When in fact, the tools and the approaches of entrepreneurial thinking and doing apply in so many areas not just to high growth, high scale venture backed companies. So that's why we use the words builder and buildership. Jackie's, I love opening the discussion with you. You are literally building art installations on things. Uh, do you consider yourself to be an entrepreneur before this program? And how do you see the term builder as something that applies to your work? Sure, thanks Kathleen. Um, you know, I would say I've always embraced an entrepreneurial mindset, but yeah, I definitely had never described myself as an entrepreneur um, for likely some of the reasons that you're hinting at. And, you know, I've talked to other builders and the word builder versus entrepreneur really resonates in our community and in the, the people I talk to. Like for me, it feels inherently collaborative. And, you know, I think approaching this work as a builder has allowed me to really engage authentically in a neighborhood I care about. So, you know, I tried really hard to be respectful and, you know, approach this in a thoughtful way. And I think having more of a builder mindset uh, allowed me to do that and engage with a lot of really interesting people in, in a community that, you know, I adore. That's great. You mentioned in your video about creating a blueprint for other cities, and I believe some other cities have reached out to you. Could you just share briefly about that? Yeah, sure. So I was invited to speak to the uh, Main Street Association in Oklahoma. Um, and so a few communities have reached out where they're interested in replicating this effort. So the idea of engaging stakeholder feedback to get a sense of what kind of business concepts do they want 
transforming vacant storefronts to be reflective of those and helping people just create a new way of um, setting up a dialogue and, and helping people see themselves as people either developing the ideas on their own or advocating for them. So I'm definitely excited and see a lot of different interests from commercial realtors to neighborhood associations interested in exploring this model as a way to just rethink how we talk about what opportunities exist in neighborhoods. So I'm just, I'm excited about seeing what's to come. That is so cool, Jackie's. Thanks. Steve, welcome. Thank you. With your Time Bank project, you are really building something that could change the way that people in your community think about volunteering. Um, and as you've gone along, what are some of the lessons that you have learned from your experiment? You were a little farther along than some folks who started in our program that you could pass along to other builders who might be interested in taking action on their ideas. Yeah, I think I was a little bit further along and it's probably because uh, I'm a little slow. But for about five years, I've been talking with uh, different schools that I work with about whether this was a good idea. And Scott talked about, you know, quick experimentation, you know, and if you, if you talk about writing on the back of a napkin and explaining things, you know, a million times to a million different people to try and get feedback on whether it's a good idea. It really took me about five years before I was ready to invest the money to build the beta version of the website. And what Builders and Backers allowed me to do was to, uh, I've, been, I've been getting feedback from all of the grownups and all of the teachers and faculty that, that saw it from one angle. Um, but I was able to get into the college community that is really where they're going to run it and get feedback from the students using an actual application that's not finished. But uh, so um, I, I would say research ask a lot of questions would probably be my biggest advice before you ever then spend the money on an expensive experiment. Um, That's so, great advice, Steve. I appreciate it. Right. I know you take that to heart. <laughs> Tammy, coming to us from beautiful Oxford, Mississippi, where it looks like it's a gorgeous day. Yes, it is beautiful here. And I'm outside because I have a dental appointment. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, you, you got to do what you got to do. You know, that's our program. We meet you Absolutely. where you are. We meet you where you are. Uh, so, Tammy, you're um, building something that is changing the way that people do business in Oxford, literally. You are helping to create new businesses, stand up new <laughs> vendors. How has being, um, seeing yourself as a builder influenced how you run your events and what you're going to do moving forward? Well, I would say um, Builders and Backers has made a major difference because I've been in business 34 years already. I'm a hairstylist by trade and have done it for a very long time, but primarily a long time I have worked alone. And so being a part of Builders and Backers, being um, having mentorship and coaching has made all the difference in the world so that I can, you know, carry that out to the people who come into my program has made the main difference teamwork make the dream work together everyone achieves more and i promise you you guys have been amazing with the help that you've given me thank you oh thank you so much tammy we love to hear that and we're excited to see you've got another cohort coming up right absolutely i do great December 3rd and 4th is going forth. I've had people already actually paying for the event. So I'm looking forward to um, making it happen and giving them more information to help grow their businesses. Awesome. Well, everyone reach out to Tammy if you want, if you know someone or want to take part in her work. And it's virtual and live in, in person. So perfect. Awesome. Thanks, Thank you. Tammy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jackie's. We can all be builders. We all have problems that we care about. And a lot of us have ideas for tackling them. And when we don't categorize those ideas right away, very early into venture, small business, nonprofit, and instead we test them and then figure out where they land, more people can take action on their ideas. So here we go with our last and amazing round of builder videos. I'm Shakori. I'm Luca. And, and we're, we're builders. builders. We want to give business owners, entrepreneurs, innovators, community change makers, the opportunity to share their story with everyone in the community directly because we know that will lead to direct support. What we're doing with this experiment is we'll have QR codes in different stores, organizations, and businesses across town. Most of them will be in the Greenwood District and all these businesses are black owned, minority owned. 
Once you scan the QR code, it will take you to the Tulsa.community platform and you'll have access to narratives of the place that you're in. You'll also have the ability to check in if you are already a loyalty member. Luca and I decided to join forces because we found that there was a lot of intersection in what we were hoping to accomplish. It's been really exciting to work together and think of, okay, how do we really create this in a way that represents both of our worlds? Luca's world being point of sale, program, tech, my world being community, ecosystem, storytelling. Builders and Backers has been an incredible program to be a part of. What I really have appreciated is the experimentation aspect of it. You didn't have to come in knowing all the answers, you actually just had to come in having questions. They were very willing to challenge us. We had to validate these assumptions we might have had or these experiments that we we're doing. And I think it ultimately made the experiment a lot stronger for us. I'm Cheryl Lawson, and I'm a builder from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Growing up in North Tulsa, it was a really bustling neighborhood. I was one of the wayward ones and, and left Tulsa for college and then subsequently work. And coming back to North Tulsa, I, I find that the development and just livelihood isn't there. I was really determined to find the folks who felt the same way that I did to make a difference. I really thought, hey, destination, neighborhood, North Tulsa and more specifically 36th Street North could be a food destination for this city. Hello, hello, welcome, welcome. In the back of my mind, I always had these ideas for my community and how I wanted to be better, but I always thought it was too big for one person. What can I do? I don't have enough money to do this. So the opportunity that Builders and Backers and Heartland Forward gave me was just the push that I needed for all the ideas that have been rolling around in my head for all these years to just, just do it. Now, I don't think any of this happens without the community. Everybody came together and to me that, that, that means the world. My name is Amanda Morrell and I'm a builder from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Our experiment, Blueprint 918, started off with a conversation. Like, what does Tulsa need in order for it to be thriving and successful? And, and that conversation led to what does young black professionals need in order to be thriving and successful in the city? And we knew that we needed a space that we could call our own. Builders and Backers has been absolutely amazing. From start to finish, they saw within us like an opportunity to really build out a program, execute an experiment to understand more about what young professionals actually want in Tulsa. Through the data, we've learned that while people do enjoy their time in Tulsa, they are really looking for more specific events to connect. One of the things that we're hoping with Blueprint 918 is when you're coming to Tulsa and it's your first time, you don't have to look for community. It's already built for you, it's right there. All you have to do is just show up to an event. And like, we're here to welcome you. I think that Tulsa has immense talent and some talent that we haven't even discovered yet. We know that if we had more support, more opportunities for people, that there's a wealth of talent to be uncovered. Hi, I'm Katie Milligan with Heartland Forward. When we first started working with builders and backers and learned of their mission, we can come together by building together, it really resonated with our work in the heartland of the country. In every community, there are builders, people who wanna take actions on ideas. And when those builders can connect and start working on solutions together, they just accelerate the rate at which they can execute on their ideas. As we saw in the video, this cohort had a number of builders that really leaned into the idea of coming together by building together. So Luca, you came in with a big idea of your own, but you were open and flexible enough to start to find another builder to partner with. And we love this. Do you think that you and Shakori would have gotten together and built Tulsa.community without being part of this cohort? Thanks, Katie. Um, that's a good question. Um, I do not. <laughs> I think Tulsa is small enough to where a lot of us that are in this space, you know, builders, creatives, we would have linked up eventually. Um, but I think just being in this context where we were already kind of 
going into this with a building mentality and already kind of in that space, it really allowed for the um, collaboration to be a lot more intentional and a lot more quick. So I don't think that would have been the case if it wasn't for this, but I'm so grateful for it because I think it was kind of like the perfect setup to bring us together. Um, Great. Yeah. Well, Shakori, you have spoken together about the importance or spoken before about the importance of building together versus building alone. And I really want to dig into this. Like, what was the process of merging your two ideas together into what has become a really cool project and can genuinely change the way that people in Tulsa buy from local businesses? Thank you, Katie. I appreciate the question and appreciate everyone's time this morning. Um, so yeah, so coming into the experiment definitely would not have, as Luca mentioned, you know, Tulsa is very small and there is a collaborative energy that's here, um, but it was really sparked by a builders and backers, Donna, Kathleen, and James, um, after we had a couple of weeks of sharing our ideas, um, which is also a testament to the program, being able to come in with an idea, not a fully fleshed out plan. Um, so already knowing, okay, there's things that could change about this, there's ways to look at it that maybe I don't see yet. Um, but when we had the opportunity to share and talk about what you know we wanted to see, what we were hoping for, they heard the synergy in being able to, you know, like, okay, you're not doing the exact same thing, but there's overlap there. The passion areas are the same. There's things that you could learn from each other. So we at least want you to know what each other are doing and kind of lean on each other as you're building your experiment. And in that process of having that conversation, um, I started to think more about, you know, what I heard so far from Luca when we had our first uh, show and tell of our artifacts and Luca pulled out his point of sale and mentioned, you know, uh, or his, was it a cash register, Luca? <laughs> both, both that and the new POS. Yeah, yeah, so when he pulled that out, it was saying like, yep, so I see this being something that can serve Black businesses across the community. And that sparked my thought when, you know, we were having that conversation later of, I want to also help and serve black businesses, but also museums, nonprofits, cultural institutions, and be able to help curate um, some of those things that could go unnoticed. And I, that thread of us both having that, how do you help create the opportunity for people to find, discover, and support things that really matter within a community? That was where our synergy lied. Um, so being able to bring those two concepts together in such a cool way, and a way we haven't seen before, we haven't seen and I use the example a lot, we use it a lot of, you know, we're conditioned to the loyalty programs with Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, mm -hmm. um, being able to get your points for going to that same place, but we haven't seen this before, being able to have rewards from a vertical of businesses that support communities that keep the dollars flowing in a way that's really intentional, as well as now adding the storytelling element and highlighting people and partners and organizations within a community that can often go overlooked. So Love that it. was, thank you. The value of us bringing, uh, coming together, and I'm really excited that we've been able to not only collaborate, but also be a picture of, you know, stepping outside of what you thought and allowing that to grow and get even better by having an open mind, especially when it comes to collaborating with other brilliant minds and um, bringing things together. Awesome. Well, thank you. Well, so moving, speaking of collaboration, Cheryl, you are one of our most active builders in helping other members of the cohort connect, especially with your killer social media skills. And can you talk a little bit about convening the power, it, like the importance of convening in a program like this and, and talk about bringing people together and collaborating? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I feel like, you know, social media is my thing. And so, you know, stepping outside of even just doing what I know um, was challenging, but it really is about community, right? Yeah, everybody has talked about um, either how small Tulsa is or how people don't know what to do in Tulsa, but it really is, um, you know, we're all comfortable in our own settings, but the importance is finding people who don't know the people that you know and connecting with uh, or other organizations and other people who can help you get your um, idea across. Social media helps with that tremendously, but also just being a part of um, individual groups. I would have never, you know, known about Luca and Chikori. Uh, I know Amanda and a few other people, but I, I didn't know what they did, right? I knew about them. And, and uh, so it was really exciting to learn more about uh, what these exciting builders 
were doing and, you know, helping them through social media, you know, that's, you know, that being a supportive person, because not everybody can buy what you do, right? Nobody can buy, you know, not everybody can buy your product or donate to your GoFundMe, but I can share it on social. I can tell other people about it. And that's how other folks get inspired and, and, and find out, hey, how can I help with this project? Because now that's in my wheelhouse, right? So that's really, you know, I started my business through community. And so it just resonates with me when you want to try to connect other people to make their businesses successful. Absolutely. And Amanda, Blueprint 918 is all about bringing people together And you actually are focused on increasing belonging and building a community and helping people to want to stay and get connected in Tulsa. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of facilitating opportunities for people to build together? Absolutely. So I think Cheryl Mm -hmm. already named it that like one of the big things about Tulsa is that it's so small. So we do in some ways know each other, but it really does go back to like if you have a business or you're building a program or you have questions about an organization or you want to know how to get involved, sometimes it's really hard to figure out how to navigate that. And so what we're trying to do at Blueprint 918 is really help be that navigation resource for you. Like we want to already have those connections readily and and available so that as soon as you step into Tulsa, or if, even if you've been in Tulsa for several years, as soon as you step into the space that we've created, you can ask, access those resources, those people, and those opportunities. And it creates a space where you really feel like you belong to Tos- Tulsa, that you're here, and that this is a community for you. Wonderful. Well, thank you to Luca, Shakori, Cheryl, and Amanda for your thoughts and all of your hard work. We are thrilled at Heartland Forward about what's been happening in Tulsa and Oxford. And we just think that the sky is the limit for all, uh, for you all. And we can't wait to watch what you are going to accomplish. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Donna for some final thoughts. Thanks, Katie. And thanks, Kathleen and James, for facilitating those conversations. And most importantly, thank you to each of you, our builders, right? This not just for sharing your ideas today and your stories with us today, but for your willingness to participate in this program, to put your ideas out there, to take that risk and to do the work to run the experiments. And I don't know about you all, but I am so incredibly inspired by your stories. You're creating small businesses and potentially scalable ventures and community projects and the pebbles that you're planting are having ripple effects, not just among the group here, but among the communities that you live in and even beyond that. So just thank you for each of you. And thank you to everybody for joining us today. I hope you're as inspired as I am. Now, we welcome everyone to be a part of this movement. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this. So first, you can learn more about the Idea Accelerator, um, either to participate or bring it to your community or organization. You can visit us at buildersandbackers.com forward slash idea dash accelerator, or just click see that link there. Um, and it's also, I think we're going to pop that in the chat. And then if you are a Heartland community, you live in a Heartland community, which is the 20 states in the middle of the country, we also invite you to visit Heartland Forward site, community.heartlandforward.org. And you can learn more about the Community Growth Program and Toolkit that Angie mentioned earlier, which is a collaboration between Heartland Forward, Accenture, and Builders and Backers. And I just want to leave you with two thoughts. Remember, we all can be builders. And as we just heard from Cheryl, we all can be backers too. More importantly, we can come together by building together. So I hope that you will take that lesson with you today to think about how you can be a builder and how you can be a backer to the people around you. And we just thank you for joining us and we hope you have a great day. The sirens are going off in Tulsa. (laughs) 